about their favorite photos during these times of COVID-19. We want to bring you inspiration and education, and that is what we're determined to do. We've got all kinds of things cooking for you, but right now we have Mr. Joey Terrell, an amazing commercial photographer with us today. Joey from the West Coast, how are you? I'm great, Mike. How are you? Hope you're staying safe. It's good. It's so good to see you. Uh, the one thing about these interviews and doing them uh, online is to be able to see my friends that we can't travel to each other to see. And, you know, seeing you, we talk a lot on the phone, certainly of our fashion tastes um, and photography. Uh, but it's so good to see you. How's everybody in your world over there? Are you guys safe? Everybody healthy? Um, everybody is staying safe. My brother, who you know, is also a photographer. Um, he is out having to cover this story. Um, mm -hmm. He is normally out shooting sports, but right now he's out uh, really working on this story, which means he puts himself at risk, and that mm -hmm. concerns me. But uh, everybody else in my circle is staying safe, and we're doing fine. Well, your brother Mark is a phenomenal sports photographer, news photographer. I've been following him for years. We've worked together for years. I feel the same way. My daughter is a nurse, and she's on the front lines every day. Yeah. Uh, I haven't seen her for months and probably won't for another few weeks, but we're going to do a drive-by this weekend so we connect. Um, we're, we're so happy to have you. And I know I've seen this. I've talked to other photographers about this, paring down your work to about seven images, six or seven images is probably not an easy thing. You probably have more favorites you want to show. And I know people can look you up, just Google you, jo Google you, Joey Terrell, and they can find your work online. I assume it, is it Joey Terrell uh, for Instagram as well? Yes. All one word. So they'll be able to see the, the full body of, of your work uh, when they go online. I know you've got a really nice educational blog uh, as well. But let's start off by uh, talking about, to me, what's always interesting is when was the first time you picked up a camera? And take us on that journey is that, to that point that you realized that this is what you were going to do for life. What's strange about it is, is I didn't pick up a camera first. I actually went into the darkroom first. Uh, for whatever reason, I was I was completely fascinated by making prints and and I guess like the Zen feeling of being in a dark room and working on pictures and things like that. Um, I took old family negatives and and would print them, and I had a great time doing it. And I was 11 years old at the time. Uh, That's I don't know. I have no idea what what drove me to want to do that. But mm -hmm. um, I begged my parents for an enlarger and they got it for me. And I set it up in a laundry room. I put, you know, developing trays and everything on the, on, on a washer and dryer. And I would work in there for hours and hours and hours at a time. And at some point about the time I turned 12, I realized I wanted my own camera so I could make my own pictures. And mm -hmm. my dad was very generous. He went out and got me a camera, an SLR, and my first picture that I ever had published, I was 12 years old. It was just a, a picture of a, a sports play at the plate at a Little League game. But it was the first taste I ever had of what it felt like to have your own work in print. And I don't think I ever looked back from that. And I just kept going. I never put the camera down. Um, I worked on the eighth grade yearbook staff, the ninth grade yearbook staff. I entered photo contests. It was something that um, I just knew that this was like a, the way I always say it, it it's like a, it's like a ticket um, that you get to go places that other people don't get to go. And at mm -hmm. the end of it, what you end up with is like a souvenir of the experience. And I realized not every photographer sees photography the same way um, in that they, they see the end result as the end result. To me, it's the experience you're having while you're holding the camera that's mm -hmm. the end result. And then the picture is just a reminder of what happened. Like I got to meet that person or I got to go see um, how they build a rocket motor or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. You end up experiencing things that no one else would ever get to experience. And then mm -hmm. the picture just becomes the souvenir of that experience. Sure. And uh, when we opened up, I defined you as a commercial photographer, but you go well beyond that. Uh, again, versatility, I think, is what keeps you in the game these days. But you do macro work. You do a lot of education on macro work and photography mm -hmm. and simple things you can do. Portraits and, and corporate, you know, portraits, uh, things like that. Yeah. Um, a very, very creative, diverse mind. Have you worked for companies as a photographer first or have you been running your own business your entire career? I mean, how, how has that journey unfolded? Well, after I, I, I went to school for it, I mean, I knew, like I say, I was only 13 and I was, I was 
like I say, working on the yearbook staff and everything else. And at some point you have to make a decision about what you want to do with your life. And mm-hmm. so um, I, I pursued it in college. I went to several different colleges. I went to art school. I went to journalism school. My dream at the time was to work at the Los Angeles Times as a photographer, be a journalist. Mm-hmm. I thought that was the end all be all. And right. ultimately I ended up there. Um, I don't think you've ever heard this story, but I had a, uh, I had a pretty severe accident which forced me to kind of change path a little bit. And what happened is, is it introduced me to somebody that I would have not met any other way. And because of that, he looked at my work and he said, "Um, you should go talk to this this person at the Los Angeles Times. And I did. And for the next two years, I worked there. And it was a great experience for a couple of reasons. One was I learned what it really means to be a journalist. So I have great... um, relation and and empathy for not only what my brother does, but also what people are doing today in, in light of this pandemic. But also it taught me that I don't want to be a journalist. I have great respect for them. But what I learned is, is I, I'm a control freak and I need the control. And that runs thoroughly counter to what it means to be a journalist. In the middle of all that, I worked for the Dodgers for a while as, uh, as, as their team photographer. I was in Vero Beach at spring training, and it was like, I, you know, Herbie Sharfman, you know, Herb Sharfman. Herb Sharfman mm-hmm. is one of the, became famous, unfortunately, side story, because in, the, in what people, many people consider to be one of the greatest sports photo, photographs of all time, the picture of Muhammad Ali over Sonny Liston taken by Neil Leifer. It's Mm -hmm. Herb Sharfman that's between his legs on the wrong side of the picture. Mm -hmm. And Herb, who is an amazing photographer, and by the time I met him, he was well into his 70s, um, taught me a lot of what it means to be a mentor, what it means to... I was 22 years old at the time, and he was like 70-something. He could have easily just dismissed me and said, hey, kid, you know, you don't belong here, or, you know, I've been around way long... He wasn't like that. He took me under his wing. He invited me to have dinner with him every day. And it was a lesson I never forgot. The point mm-hmm. being is, is that it's, I think it's important to feel inside of yourself as a photographer, whether what you're doing is something you love or something you're doing because you like the idea of it. And those aren't mm-hmm. the same things. I meet a lot of people who want to be sports photographers and they are enamored with the idea of standing on the sideline of a big game. But when they see what that actually means, that it's snowing or raining or you're shoulder to shoulder with other people or you can't be in the position you want to be in, Mm -hmm. suddenly being a sports photographer isn't as great as. And I was one of those people. I thought being Mm -hmm. a journalist was the was what I wanted to do. And I quickly learned that this isn't for me. And I went off and I did something else. And that's how I ended up in the commercial realm. That's so funny because Deanne Fitzmorris and I, we, we have another interview with Deanne, the Pulitzer Prize winner and Nikon ambassador. She just talked about covering the Super Bowl in which uh, Kansas City won and the quadrant she was in and not being able to move and elbow to elbow and action happening on the other side. You, you're, you're right. It just quickly just dissipates and disappears is exciting when you have to get there early and you have to stay there for six hours. And, and you know, but I, I want to tap on the whole mentorship because that leads me into a conversation about you and education. You are a big educator these days. You do a lot of workshops. You have a blog um, that you have, uh, you know, constantly educated with. So you're giving it back. I mean, in the way of a lot of great education, talk about how you are a mentor now to people. It it is probably something that I never expected the, the educational component of, of photography to enter my life. I, I give complete credit to um, a masterful photographer and a very, very iconic person in photography, um, Rich Clarkson, who mm-hmm. about 20 years ago, he, he pulled me aside and he said, there are some people, we were, at a, we were at a workshop together and he said, there's some people here who are interested in learning about lighting. Would you be interested in going over and, you know, and this was on the spot, this was not planned. He said, would you be interested in going over and, and, and helping them out? Just you know, throw something together. We did a portrait and it was fun. And and I think people got a lot out of it, but nobody got as much out of it as I did. Mm -hmm. I walked away from that so invigorated and I immediately understood what I'd never understood before, which is, you know, teachers and and college professors, the, the 
the absolute satisfaction that you get out of that, I never understood until I did it. And so mm -hmm. for the last 20 years, it's been a, a component of what I do. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm carefully choose where I like to teach because not everybody has the same philosophy about teaching. I know mm -hmm. there are some, um, you know, and I don't think this is controversial to say. I think it's just a fact that there are some people who have the philosophy that photography is a club and you need someone else's permission to join it. Um, I don't subscribe to that at all. It's not a boot camp. It's not a place to make sure that people understand that I'm here and you're here and you should never forget it. It's, mm -hmm. it's an opportunity to take all photographers, no matter what level you're at, and raise them up a notch or two notches or more. That's mm -hmm. all it is. And so from my perspective, if I have something that I know that you would like to know, I'm more than willing to tell you. Mm -hmm. And people say, and it's the funniest thing to me, I say, they'll say to me, they'll go, you know, you seem so open, you'll tell us anything. And I'm like, why wouldn't I? And mm -hmm. they say, well, but you're giving away all your secrets and every, I said, look, I have made so many mistakes over the course of my career. There's no way you'll catch me. <laughs> I'm so far ahead of you in mistakes. Yeah. You will never catch me. So I already know what not to do. You don't know what not to do yet. You're going to have to make those mistakes. I'm not worried about it. So mm -hmm. I'll tell you anything. I You ask me anything you want. I'll tell you anything I know. And that, that's an amazing thing because you, what you've just talked about in Rich Clarkson reminds me of two things. Uh, I think it was Rich is the first one I ever heard say that uh, the best photographers in the world don't show the bad stuff. And Rich was a tough critic uh, when he was critiquing portfolios. And uh, what you say here uh, about you and giving back, uh, the best photographers in the world are not afraid to share their secrets because they're never intimidated or insecure and actually have a better positive attitude to say, hey, if somebody else can do it better, that's even great. That's a, that's a testimonial to my, my mentorship. So with that, what I'd love to do is uh, start to bring up some of the pictures that you've selected for us. I'm sure they have some great backstories and meaning. Do not spare any, any details uh, as to how you made some pictures. So... I'm going to start to share this screen and I'm going to pull up a keynote deck and we're going to go right to play. You and I get pushed to the side. And now the beauty of your art starts. Handsome gentleman, nicely done portrait. Talk about this. What's the backstory here? What's this about? So uh, it's, it's funny because we just finished talking about Rich Clarkson and now we're going to talk about Rich Clarkson again. Um, <laughs> it was, it, it's, it's a long story, but it's a worthwhile story. So about, 20, a little more than 20 years ago, I had been doing commercial work for a number of years. Um, it was going very well. Um, I was for the most part happy, but at some point, you know how you go through your portfolio and you kind of review what you've been doing and you uh, look at the work and you back then, you know, websites weren't as common as they are now. So it was a printed portfolio, but you look mm -hmm. at your work and you're always looking for the recent stuff and you say, I need to pull some old stuff out, put some new stuff in. And I realized that I had gone three straight years without doing a piece of work that I was proud enough of that I wanted to put it in the portfolio. And that isn't because I was doing bad work necessarily. It was because the work I was doing was being done for someone else and I wasn't particularly proud of it. It was good, it served the purpose, but I wasn't finding any sort of satisfaction out of making those pictures. And it got so mm -hmm. bad that my brother and I uh, had a conversation and I said, you know, we should really look into doing something else. I said, this isn't, this isn't working out for me. I'm not happy. I felt a lot of stress sure. and, and so on. And uh, about the same time, I got a brochure in the mail again, more than 20 years ago. So brochures in the mail were a common thing. Um, I got a brochure mm -hmm. in the mail for a uh, workshop that was being held in Jackson, Wyoming. And the workshop had as a list of uh, faculty, a who's who of nature and documentary photographers. I mean, the, mm -hmm. all legends, every single one of them. And I said to him, I said, I've never been to Wyoming. This seems like a fun thing. What do you say we go? So we did. And what happened was, uh, is I decided that I was going to make portraits and he was going to do documentary work. And he did all kinds of crazy stuff. He actually mounted a remote camera on a horse. Uh, he's a big remote camera guy. He put a remote he's camera been on a known horse. known to do that all quite kinds a bit. Of crazy things. It was really fun. But I did portraits mm -hmm. of cowboys. 
And I got to the end of the week after having done five portraits. And I, I said to him, I go, this is what I want to do. This is what's mm -hmm. been missing. Mm -hmm. And the lesson of it is, is that um, the great Life magazine uh, picture editor, John Lowengard, has a quote that I've heard many, many times. And the quote is, shoot what you can't help but shoot. And what he means by that is, is always pursue pictures that are your best work and will, uh, you know, come from the best part of yourself. It's the kind of work that if you work, if you do pictures for a living, it's the kind of work that you would do for free. And this picture for me is an example of that. It's a, it's no one was telling me what to do. No one told me where to stand. No one, no art director had drawn it up in, in advance, which meant every decision that got made to make the picture was mine which means I own the picture in the sense of, if it's bad, it's on me. If it's good, mm -hmm. it's on me. But I don't feel like it's been compromised by someone else's hand being involved in it. Now you can't always do that, but mm -hmm. this picture always, always, always reminds me of the lesson I learned by following what it is that you can't help but do. And so mm -hmm. really what it did is all at once, it changed the entire direction of my career. I took this picture and then I did another workshop, which was a sports workshop and did the exact same thing. I made five portraits, all illuminated, et cetera. And I mm -hmm. took it and I started building a whole new portfolio. And because of that, I built a whole new career with different people in a different direction and for all different reasons. And I, was, I have not been happier since. So it always reminds you of that. From a technical standpoint, um, it was done on film. Uh, it there are uh, one, two, three, four lights in the picture, um, mm -hmm. and it's just it's meant to look like it's um, lit without being lit. The mm -hmm. idea is it's uh, you know there are different couple different kinds of lighting. There's you can light for effect or you can light to simulate reality. And in this case, I'm I'm lighting to simulate reality, or hopefully. When you went to school, you studied photography, you said, did most of the learning about lighting happen in school or, it, I mean, you're a master at this. I'm just going to say it. I'm going to brag on you a little bit. Thank you. And, and so did that come afterwards? You just started to build on your techniques and build on your arsenal of, of, of lighting products and things like that. Talk about that. Yeah, it was both. Um, I went to, and it goes back to the LA times and that they sent me out to do a portrait of, uh, uh, a very famous uh, concert pianist named Leon Fleischer who is tremendous at, at what he does um, as, a, as, a, as a pianist. And I took out a couple of tiny little lights uh, and then I didn't know what I was doing with it because they said to me, we'd really like it if you went out, out and, and lit this. And I panicked. I'm like, oh my, mm -hmm. I, don't know, I don't know how to light things. I don't know. Mm -hmm. So I got a hold of a couple of lights and I made a picture and I was thrilled with and it. And it helped me to make the decision because I had controlled everything, I put the lights where I wanted to put them and I had positioned him the way I wanted to position him. It was still for a journalistic publication, but when you're making a portrait, it's a control thing. You, you know that every element is being controlled. And I walked away from that saying, I really like this. So to answer your question, as I've gone through my career, yes, lighting has been something that dovetails very nicely for me with the control because mm -hmm. I want it to look a certain way. And one of the ways I can make it look a certain, a certain way is through light. And I want to point out that you mentioned this is back in the days you were shooting film. So there was no, you know, cheat card on the back of the camera. No. There was no you know, a, a, a instant gratification of what that lighting looked like or instant uh, information. So so this is a bit of, a bit more of a challenge, um, you know. It is, then. but Mike, I'll tell you, it it it's there's something to be said for that, and I would almost encourage photographers. Um, Ansel Adams, the great uh, uh, landscape photographer, um, he he always advocated picturing the finish finished picture in your mind before you even begin. He had a name for it. Um, he called it pre visualization. You can call it visualization. You can call it picture in your mind. Whatever you call it. It, it's it's the idea that you think about how the picture is going to finish and then you just work backward. I always draw the metaphor, the, the uh, comparison to cooking. If you don't know what you're going to cook, you have no idea what ingredients you need. So it sure. isn't until you decide what the finished dish is going to be 
what for you to determine whether you need do you, I need pasta or do you need beef or do I need chicken? What do I need to make this dish complete? And I look at photography or a photograph the same way as how's it going to look? And then I just work backward. And so lighting for me is something that it's important to understand how light works. And that comes with experience. But um, yeah, I, 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 I really think that a good exercise for a photographer is to cover their LCD, try mm -hmm. to picture how an image is going to look and see how close you can come just by taking meter readings or picturing how it's going to look and see how close you get. It will help you and it'll relieve a lot of the stress of, uh, oh my gosh, this overwhelms me. So as we, as we roll on, uh, I don't know, from that picture you just showed to now, a few years apart? Yes, definitely. Um, and one of the things about this picture to me is, is it, it, it points to um, the value of being, um, it's a hard thing to say because I'm not all that comfortable talking about me as I am about the pictures and what can be learned from them. But I'll say mm -hmm. this, there, there is a lot of value as a photographer to me, to being a, a, a well-rounded photographer. Maybe that's a good way to put it because I always feel as though um, if you understand how to do this kind of photography, it will it will help you in that kind of photography. And then that kind of photography will help you in this. And so mm -hmm. as an example, this is really an architectural photograph with a person in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. And so understanding how something like a perspective control lens works and understanding mm -hmm. the value of a perspective control lens, most portrait photographers wouldn't use a lens like that at least not this way. They would think about it as something you could, a perspective control lens is something that um, moves independently of the body itself. So you can raise the front of the lens or lower the lens. You can move mm -hmm. it side to side and you can also tilt it and adjust focus. It's great for um, products. It's great for if you want to make a portrait and you want to have selective focus so that sure. only the eyes are, are sharp, but the nose and the mouth are out. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's great for that. But it also, um, for a picture like this, to me, it would look funny to have those window mullions not straight. And so a perspective control lens gives you the ability to position all of the, all of the lines perfectly uh, vertical and parallel. And so knowing of something technical like that mm -hmm. is really helpful. Also knowing how color balance, white balance works. And how say, it there's will, a lot more to this picture than just there you know, one color setting, right? That's right, right. Because if you look at the, it's a, it's a terrible day. You can see it through the window. And it's an old trick uh, where you have an overcast day, you end up with a white sky. But one of the ways to solve it is if you change your white balance setting in the camera, you end up with uh, this blue. If you change it to tungsten, which is, which is what's mm -hmm. going on here. Right. So once you have that, if you drop the exposure a little bit, you can suddenly see the refinement in the clouds. You don't notice what's going on in the street so much. And, and then if you then introduce your own light into the picture, um, you then can bring the value of that light up to the level that dominates the rest of the blue. My yeah. thing when I look at a picture is always, where do I want the viewer to look? I don't want to be ambiguous about it. I want them to know exactly, look right here. Mm -hmm. That's that's my job as a photographer. Right. So continuing along the technical part of this, because we've changed the, the white balance here to blue, I have to make sure that the lights I'm using are correct for that color balance. If they're not, he would be blue too. So right. I have I've done that, I've corrected that light. But another technical challenge is because there's all these faceted windows, they're gonna the light will be seen in the window. Mm -hmm. So it's somewhere in the room. You have to find a way to hide that light so it's not seen in the window. So that involves taking what's called a flag and obscuring, putting the flag, which is just simply black fabric, placing mm -hmm. it between the light source and the person so that the light hits the person, but it doesn't hit the window. The window can't see the light source. So that gets rid very, of very precise with that light. You're going to be right. dead so, on accurate. And, on and you're precise using a, a grid, which is what I'm using. And then the last thing I would point out is because the, the beam of light is so narrow, 
and controlled, you need to be able to see the rest of them. Now, his right and left arms, I can see okay, but you'll notice his knee has just a hint of value on it. If I don't put that light there, he's a floating torso. You don't see the rest of them. But what I'm doing for the viewer is saying, I'm not, I don't want to hit him over the head with it. I just want to say the rest of him is there. And so mm -hmm. I hit it with a light from the side, very subtly, another grid, and I left the color balance alone so that it would match the rest of the room. So the only place that has what I call a visual anchor that's mm -hmm. correct is his face. And so you know exactly where to look. So everything is calculated. Every splash of light is calculated. The color temperature is calculated. Um, wh which uh, PC lens was this? Uh, this would be the 24 PC. Because mm -hmm. there was 24, 45, there was uh, the 85 <clears throat> PC. Uh, Don't forget the, the 19. Days, 28 PC. Yeah, the 19. 19. The 19 is a beautiful, oh latest. my gosh, what a beautiful optic. So now what I'd like you to do is uh, spend about uh, 15 minutes talking about Schleimflug and the Schleimflug <laughs> effect of, no, don't, we don't need to go there. That's um, one of those so, words that people, you know, they walk, they walk into a bar and pull that word out and everybody scatters. I swear to you, our producer Brian's sitting there listening right now going, Schleimflug, what, what are they talking about? Yeah, this um, is a G-rated uh, interview. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, so this is obviously part of the corporate work that you've done uh, yes. as part of your corporate portfolio and, and just another genre within your career um, that you have shown. Jeets, Derek Jeter. I know a lot of Yankee fans that would uh, love seeing this portrait. It's a beautiful portrait of, of Derek, probably one of my favorite baseball players of all time. Uh, even though I'm screaming out there publicly, I'm a Mets fan. Um, talk about this. What's this experience in being able to photograph this celebrity and how did you handle it uh, as you set it up and dealt with the celebrityism of it all? Yeah, there's a, there's a, miscon there's a misconception. I, I want to I wanna mention this part first. There's a misconception that people will come up to you and they'll say, oh, you're so lucky you get to work with these celebrities and athletes and, and, and so on. And I say, it's 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 a challenge because their time is way more valuable than anybody else's. And you think to yourself, I mean, in this case, this picture was done for Major League Baseball, but um, pictures I've done for Sports Illustrated or Golf Digest or any other sports related um, entities. Um, mm -hmm. It's always the same thing in that you think if you're working for one of those entities, you're going to get all the time in the world. And it's actually just the opposite. You get you get very little time. So. In this case, I know that this shoot lasted 86 seconds. The way I know that is from the metadata in the camera, um, the first frame to the last was 86 seconds long. Mm -hmm. The prep to do it was five hours ahead of that. Now we're down in a, um, in a, like a, just off the dugout at a baseball stadium and um, it's at an all-star game and the athletes are coming through and I'm making portraits of it, as many of them as are willing to do it. So I had to find a space that would do it and it's all arranged and you know there's there's a whole team of people that are working on this but it it really speaks at least to me it speaks to preparation and how important it is for you as a photographer to take the time to refine and refine and refine and get it dialed in mm -hmm. so when somebody of his stature is willing to come in and sit for you, you take absolutely as little of his time as you can to get what it is you need. Um, mm -hmm. I, I have often said that that I will trade willingly. I will trade time with the subject in favor of time ahead of the subject. So I'll give you an example. If I was doing a portrait of him for, say, Sports Illustrated, and uh, they said he, he has a half an hour, I would say, but but you you can only have a half an hour in total. So the, from the moment you come to the ballpark to the time you leave, you only have a half an hour. Mm -hmm. I would easily trade. I would say, how about if I take three minutes with with him and you give me three hours ahead of him? They will more than gladly make that trade. And the reason is, is because his time is worth way more than mine. So mm -hmm. if I can get in there and get all completely dialed in, then my stress level and my anxiety is much lower. I don't, I'm not worried when he sits down, is everything right? Is it gonna look good? Because I've spent all the time testing it, I know it's gonna look good. We've mm -hmm. planned it, we've thought it through, it all, 
is is working. And so and that, pro- that probably means a lot to them too, because they got to move on to somewhere else. And to see sure that you do. have got it down and you're prepared for them shows a lot of professionalism. And that's going to be a word I use with you a lot during this segment is how professional you are. But that's got to count you. for something. No, it carries through because um, it's funny. You you see the same people, um, whether it's your client or it's um, it's the athlete themselves. Um, you see the same people over and over and over again. And the idea is you want to build relationships with people so that they want to work with you again. And if you do things like, I mean, the most famous <laughs> photography phrase is just one more. Mm-hmm. And it, it's funny, but it's a terrible habit because people, if you forget what it feels like to be photographed, you should remind yourself. It's a very uncomfortable thing to be photographed. And so I always remind people when I'm, when I'm teaching, I always go, make sure that from time to time you sit in front of the camera so that, pe- so that you remember what your subjects feel like. And so mm-hmm. in the case of somebody like him, yes, he's an icon. Yes, he's been photographed a million times. But I don't know that that makes him any less um, sensitive to being mm-hmm. in front of a camera. You feel scrutinized. And so mm-hmm. if I can get my job done in 86 seconds, he'll remember that. And if there's a bunch of people saying, hey, can I have a picture? If he spots me, he might give it to me because he knows I'm not going to take 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. And that, again, having those little things that you can count on and that you do. Uh, Matthew Jordan Smith, when I interviewed him, you know, he said it was the music that he had uh, on when people were coming through. Mm-hmm. Lynn Goldsmith, when I interviewed her, said she did the same thing you do. She jumps in front of the camera not only to feel like what it's like to have the camera pointed at her, but uh, to let them take the active role in looking behind the camera. Now, I'm guessing with Derek, you're not going to have that opportunity. Um, but um, talk no, a little but bit about it, the lighting. The, the, the one thing oh, I would ahead. add is, is that you know, th- something like this takes a team. Um, it takes coordination. It takes a lot of people working together, not the mm-hmm. least of which are the great assistants that you have the, the real pleasure of working with and building relationships of, of your own with. I mean, in this case, I remember distinctly the assistant that was with me that day who is a world-class person and a world-class assistant, it was his job to make sure that no matter what, how his head moved, that he would follow him with that light. The light is so tight on his face that if he moved this far, he's out of the light. So Mm -hmm. that meant we had to rig something so that the assistant could very easily track him as he shifted or moved in and out. It was a Mm -hmm. critical thing. And you have to trust your team to be able Mm -hmm. to, you know, pull something like that off. It's critical. How, how many pictures did you get off during this shoot? Uh, I'd have to count, but I would say at the most, you know, nine or 10. Mm, yeah, it goes. Yeah, It's not something you're motoring fast. through. You're waiting for him. I mean, maybe it's drop a shoulder. I'd rather work with a subject and, and get one or two good frames than just hope that I get it. When I was younger, I used to do that. I would, mm-hmm. I was so f- freaked out by all the lights I had going and not being as prepared as I could be that I forgot what a lot of people refer to as gesture and um, you know, what's going on inside the frame. And I was so focused on the technical aspects that I wouldn't work with the subject enough. And I realized I have to get to the point where the technical stuff all falls away and it's me and the person. Gotcha. Me and the person. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, beautifully, beautifully done. Thank you. Um, I, I love this portrait. I've seen this one before. Um, where are you? Who is that? Why are you photographing them? What's the backstory on this? So up until recently, this was the world champ, world heavyweight champion of the world, Deontay Wilder. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is very, this, I wanted this to talk about this because of the serendipity of it, but also the simplicity of it. Um, mm-hmm. This was actually done at a photo workshop, uh, about 10 years ago. And uh, he was at the Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs, Colorado training. He's got a great story. Um, uh, His his daughter, if I'm not mistaken, has a congenital uh, um, birth defect issue. Uh, And he, he has done everything from driving a beer truck to all sorts of things to try and support her and and her medical needs. Right. And one of the ways he started uh, trying to support her was through boxing. So there he was at the Olympic Training Center, um, honing his skills, 
the Olympics uh, were, I want to say, in, in six months or so, and he ultimately won the bronze medal, if I'm not mistaken. But um, I walked into the boxing gym and I started talking to people. I needed a subject for the class that I was teaching. And I walked into the gym and I said, you know, who's the promising one here? And I, I just, you know, engaged a number of different people in the room and they said him. And well, he's six foot eight. And so when I walked up to him, I mean, I was like this. It's, it's, he's massive and his reach uh, he is, is unbelievable too. And I asked him, you know, would you be, and, and part of this, it's a really important part. Part of being a photographer, particularly if you're a portrait photographer, is the technical part for sure. You have to know your cameras and lenses. You have to know your lighting. You got to know all of that. But the other part of it is the human relationship you bring to it. How able are you to convince people that you're not going to make them look bad? How able are you to convince people that it's worth their time to go in front of your camera? It's a mm -hmm. skill every bit as important as your ability to, you know, work f stops and shutter speeds. And so, I was able to to talk him into spending some time. It's particularly difficult because there's a class going on, and I want them to shoot as well. So he has to commit to a little bit of time. And so, what I wanted to do is demonstrate to the group that we're in a room at the time that's all fluorescent lit. The light is horrible. It's sure. even and it's terrible. There's no drama. Mm -hmm. What I have pictured in my mind is some Scorsese kind of boxing gym, the kind mm -hmm. that, you know, there's a big shaft of light coming in through a, a skylight or something like that. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't this gym. It's a, it's a, it's a, it had a high ceiling, but it was all fluorescent lights. And right. so this is a great example of what one single light can do, number one. Um, and number two, it's problem solving. On either side of him is ugliness. Mm -hmm. But this one blue wall, to me, was an interesting spot. And so what I did is I just put a single light up on a light stand as high in the air as I could get it. And by doing that, it made the source very small. When you make right. the source small, you get a lot of very strong shadows, as opposed to a soft box, which makes the source large, the mm -hmm. shadows become much softer. So in this case, I wanted the drama of the shadow and I wanted the light to fall off, you know, down around his knees. So again, it's the same kind of thing. I want you to look here. And so in talking to him, you know, I looked at this blue wall and I said, this would be a great place for a portrait. And then I also looked at, you know, what kind of wardrobe do you have? Do you have any mm -hmm. other shorts? And he had these red shorts and I thought this would be perfect. It's red, white, and blue. He's an Olympic boxer. It'll be yeah. great. And so I just, I had someone hold the stand, you know, it was straight up like this and I just had them tilt it so that it was almost coming straight down. And I just had him look at up at it. And uh, I, I say that the simplicity of it is important because I think sometimes when people think about lighting, they think they need to have three and four and five of them. And I always say, start with one. And when you feel like you've run out of possibilities with one, then try two. But until you can master the one, um, mm -hmm. I think you're just going to overwhelm yourself. But even at one, there's plenty that you can do with a single light source. Well, you know, a lot of times we're outside, we have that one light source, the yeah. sun. So anything we can do to simulate that is a great thing. And, you know, you bring up a very important point I want to reflect on and just at least mention before we move on is your job is to make people look good. I deal with that in rock and roll all the time. And in and, and the work you do, you want someone to bring you back. You want to make the best possible picture of them you possibly can. Yes. And what I, I again, I love this simplicity because I, I use the word intent. Everything you do is with intent. And to try to simulate that one light overhead that's in a hallway with not a lot of other light around it. I mean, you've done it so perfectly here in the way it kind of just kind of fades out and, you know, carries down through his body. But I think it's just his look and his expression that brings it all together for me. It, well, I appreciate that. But I would add that, you know, I always, you know, I hate to characterize photography as a, as a choice between being technical or being natural. Um, mm -hmm. But I would say, and I, and I always use the metaphor of like a painter. If you give mm -hmm. a painter a single brush and a single color, they'll still paint, but it's going to be pretty limited. If you mm -hmm. give a painter a wide range of brushes and a wide range of hues, 
they can do anything. And so I always encourage photographers, think of the technical part of photography as, as that, as brushes. So your lenses are like your brushes. And then the technical knowledge you have is very much like the hues and colors and shades and tones that exist on a painter's palette. Mm -hmm. I bring that up because one of the functions of, of lights is the ability to make them narrow. Like in the case of a speed light, um, a lot of people don't, I don't think either don't know or don't use that you there's a zoom function where you can take and you can narrow the beam down so that it's very, very narrow. So light isn't going everywhere. Now, most right. of the time that's happening automatically when the flash is in the hot shoe, but mm -hmm. when you take it off, you can actually control that beam. And so in a case like this, what I did is I narrowed the beam down so that I would get light only where I want it and not everywhere. And so mm -hmm. what I'm really trying to say is, is this is an example of taking technical understanding and then using it to make the picture you're trying to make. And that I think is the perfect marriage of photography. Absolutely. And, and, and very, very well done. Here's a gentleman that many photographers recognize. His name is Jay Maisel. Um, this is a beautiful portrait of Jay. Thank you. Um, what's going on here? Why'd you make it? Where were you? Tell us some of the backstory. Tell us something interesting that Jay may have said during the shoot, because I'm sure there was. Um, what's um, going on? So uh, this, again, it's funny how Rich Clarkson becomes, uh, runs as a common thread throughout a, a number of things. And what's funny is- I just want to say too, though, it, for those of you that don't know Rich Clarkson, Google him. He is one epic photographer uh, and, and has pioneered a lot of workshops. So Google him um, when you get a chance, but continue on. Sorry to interrupt. It's all right. He he is um, uh, he has been um, just just to say a word about him. He is he's had five photo careers that any one of us would be uh, um, eager to have. Director mm -hmm. of photography, um, pho contract photographer. I mean, all he he was the head of of, of uh, NPP. I mean, he's been done so many things. For so many people, it's it's mm -hmm. it's hard to quantify. But exceptional photographer. Yes, uh, yeah, that too, uh, which is that's what's what's amazing. Anyway, so I was at a workshop, um, one of his workshops. Uh, this is probably I don't know eight eight years ago or so, and there were a number of photographers that were there, icons, um, Jody Cobb for, as one, uh, mm -hmm. the great editor Marianne Golan. Um, yeah. Just, just a whole list of people that were there, and mm -hmm. the NPPA was actually writing a story on uh, Rich and the faculty and the workshops. These are all icons; you would know all their names. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, he said to me, he said, um, "They're here doing a story, and we need portraits of all the faculty. Would you be? Could we ask you to to do that for us?" And I, I'm like telling no you, I, I was the minute he asked, I was terrified. Mm -hmm. And I, my first inclination was to say, absolutely not. Because really, it is absolutely it's it's incredibly intimidating to shoot people who are your heroes. Mm -hmm. And every one of them is a hero of mine. So the mm -hmm. idea of them standing in front of my camera was absolutely a horrifying thought. And my my knee jerk response was to say no. Are you, do you um, feel like you're going to be judged? Is it so they're going to direct you, or you you lose your power? What what's the fear? Uh, it's 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 the fear of um, and well, that's what's funny. I mean, I have shot uh, all kinds of iconic people. I mean, Jeter, uh, um, um, Ariana Grande, Rihanna, Justin Bieber. I mean, there's bunches of people that I've shot who you would think would be intimidating. None of them intimidate me, but other photographers who I respect and maybe it's because what they do is something I understand and therefore I respect it more than maybe I respect, uh, um, you know, what it means to be a singer or an athlete or something like that. Mm -hmm. They're icons to me. And so the idea of, of, of doing that was, was something that was just crazy. The other reason it was crazy to me is I didn't have anything with me. I didn't have any gear. I was there visiting just like almost on vacation. I wasn't part of the workshop. I wasn't a student at the workshop. I was just there um, seeing, saying hello to some friends, Rich and some other people. And uh, it, it, they, to use his word, he said, can we take advantage of you being here? And I thought, all right, I'll figure it out. But I immediately realized I have no gear and I'm a gear guy. 
um, you know, I need my tools. And so it became an exercise in problem solving. Um, mm -hmm. I had to figure out where I could get lights and modifiers and things. So I went to the catering department and I got black and white tablecloths. The black ones could be used as flags. The white ones could be used as um, diffusers. I got chairs and tables so that I could build um, obstructions so I could create shafts of light. Um, I actually s borrowed, uh, if you've you know been in a hotel and you've looked up in your bathroom and you've seen, sometimes there's like a grid of a, a grid pattern kind of plasticky thing that directs the light straight down. I went up and took that out and brought it with me so I could use it as a grid to control the light. Um, right. And I just, you know, monkeyed around until I got it all set up the way I wanted and created the kind of light that I would normally use but I, I used anything and everything that I could find to do it. And it, it taught me a lot. One is the value of really good gear. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the other is, is that there are ways to solve problems. And if you um, really think about it, there's, there is a way to make the picture that you want to make. Mm -hmm. The portraits of, uh, of, of Derek Jeter and the boxer and Jay, what's your focal length? Is that closer to 85 or 105? I'm a big, um, I'm a, I love 105 to 200. I'm, mm -hmm. I love that range. That's a big range for me. So this, this is probably, I'd have to look, but this, this is probably somewhere between 150 and 200. I just mm -hmm. like what longer lenses do to the human face. It's mm -hmm. my, my go-to lens for so many years, long before digital existed was the, the 180 2.8 ED the internal focusing, um, one of the most beautiful lenses and the, you could shoot it wide open and it just looked brilliant. Today, the equivalent of that lens would, for me would be the 105-14. But mm -hmm. it was just, it just, I love the way that it, 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 it rendered the human face. And so I've mm -hmm. always been, um, I've always favored that 100 to 200 length. Mm -hmm. I, um, I can associate with you with a little bit of the nerves and trying to photograph one of your mentors or idols as a photographer. We were at uh, the Photo Plus show recently and we had the Nock Nikor uh, on display, but we also had an, a legendary rock photographer, Baron Woolman there. Oh yeah. And you know, I couldn't, it was like everything moving at the same, got to get him, got to get his portrait, got to do it at 0.95, you know, but to me, what you're doing is you're kind of laying it out there because you know that person's going to be expecting to see that end result. So you yes. better get it and you better get it right um, yes. because now you kind of laying it out there. And uh, I will say too, you know, um, Joey's mentioned uh, Jody and Marianne, two amazing people in photography. Marianne's an incredible editor in, in photography as well. And Jody Cobb paved the way for women in journalism. So the two great, great people uh, in this business. So I, I can see where the pressure factor uh uh, right, in. but I mean, it was, I mean, Jim Richardson from National Geographic, Tom Jim Mangelson, Richardson, yeah. the amazing um, nature and landscape photographer, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and Rich, Rich Clarkson himself was one of them. So, I mean, all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're saying to yourself, oh my gosh, I'm, if I don't die before this is over, and you just hope that you, you flatter them with a portrait that they're, they're happy with. But I bet you now you're happy you had that opportunity. Yes. Yes, and hence the the value of not saying no. So, so when Jay saw this picture, I got to know what was his response. Uh, I don't know. I honestly oh. don't know. I the way I look at it, knowing Jay, and I've had the good fortune to spend some time with with Jay. Um, the fact that I didn't hear anything about it is probably the best news possible. <laughs> No news is good news. Absolutely. I think that one thing, I mean, Jay is an exceptional photographer, the master of color and light and, and shape and, and throughout the frame. And as he taught, and I've been to some of his lectures, first one to ever let me see that there was actually an arrow in a FedEx logo, um, which I looked at for, for years and didn't see. And, and he has a great way of teaching everybody how to see. Yes. We're going to kind of shift gears to something you've been working on a lot more lately. And, and don't reveal what's in the photos just yet. Let's talk a little bit about what your inspiration is for close-up photography. To me, every time you post a picture like this, it's a guessing game. What did Joey use now? Because it's probably some common household item and, and, and I never get them right. I don't think I get them right. 
I, I don't know what this is, but I'm sure you're going to share it with me. But you do some exceptional close-up work. What drove you to macro close-up and, um, and, and made that a bit of a passion of yours? Because you're doing a lot of that lately. Thank you. It's, it's something I've always, um, I've always loved. For years, I, was, uh, um, uh, <laughs> I, I did a lot of d- scuba diving around the world. And it was a real passion for me. And I, I didn't really realize why it was a passion until I started thinking about it after I did that cowboy picture. And the reason was was this for the same reason. It was the only place I could go where no one was talking to me and no one was telling me what to do. And my favorite thing to do was macro work. I would lay on the bottom of the of the ocean and uh, I would have a, a macro lens and I would just lay there. And the only thing I could hear were bubbles. And the only thing I saw was the, whatever the subject was, usually it was a fish darting in and out of some crevice and me just patiently waiting to make the picture I wanted to make. And, you know, I look at uh, amazing photographers like Brian Scary, and it, 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 it makes you feel very small about your abilities um, doing macro work. But it's something that I've always um, I've always loved what getting close to things reveal, uh, mm-hmm. how it reveals details and textures and colors and things like that. Mm-hmm. I'd also mention leading into your to, to the answer to your question. When I was in art school. One of my professors gave me one of the um, one of the absolute best assignments I think I've ever received, and the assignment was simply this: it was you had to make a picture of a common everyday item or object, but and it was a strict pass or fail. All you had to do is make a good picture of it, but no one in the class could recognize what it was. If anyone knew what it was or could recognize it, you failed. And the challenge was, is you had to do it as, a, as such an abstract that no one could see what it was, but it had to be very common. And what, mm-hmm. what the exercise taught me was that your initial responses are always wrong. What you always do when you're looking at how to create a photograph is you look for something you've seen before. At least this is what I do. I, I look at something and I and I imagine in my head something I've already seen. Well, that's the wrong thing you want to do. You don't want to do that. It's already been done. So mm-hmm. his assignment was essentially to think of something in a way that you don't normally think of it. And it was brilliant. And I've never forgotten it. And so particularly now in the time we're living in, it's great to be able to find common everyday items and um, make pictures of them. So this is an example of that. Um, I'll start at the top as what you're of what you're looking at. It's simply water droplets on a sheet of optical glass, and the water droplets are magnifying what's underneath it. A water droplet is essentially, if it's formed properly, it's a lens. It mm-hmm. it 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 shows you what's underneath it. And so the trick to doing this is creating perfect lenses, if you will. Um, mm-hmm. And you do that by using a, a common product that um, you would spray on your windshield to keep keep it from streaking. You, it, what it does is it makes the water bead and you get a perfectly round water droplet, which mm. gives you a, a good forming image. The next right. trick is ha- putting something underneath that water, those water droplets that is interesting looking and not everything you think will work will work. Um, I found that the, The things that are flat tend to work better, Um, Mm -hmm. but something like this works really, really well. And the reason that it does is because not only can you see the subject, but you can see around it and through it, which I I got to look closer. I got to look closer. I'm still stumped. I don't know what this is. And I know you posted it before. I'm stumped. It is, it it is. is for those of you who drink coffee. It's the bottom of a French press. And so it's the strainer that goes at the bottom of a French coffee press. And the mm-hmm. idea is, is that like the blue light is coming, is lighting the side of it. It's sitting, the, the structure looks like this. There's a pane of glass that has the droplets of water. And then there's right. another pane of glass beneath it, holding the strainer. And then there's a light from the side that's lighting the strainer blue. And then underneath that is a background that I'm lighting with magenta light. So the magenta light is coming up through the strainer. The blue light is hitting the strainer itself, right? So what's disorienting about this sometimes is that you're looking at what's in the water droplets themselves, 
but you're also mm -hmm. looking at the subject itself. The magenta mm -hmm. part is actually the subject. The, the droplets are magnifying the subject and putting them in focus. And so that's the part mm -hmm. you focus the lens on are the water droplets and the rest of it then goes out of focus. I think out of all of the pictures you've posted doing this kind of stuff, I picked off one immediately and it was the disc brake of a bike <laughs> because I was familiar with it. Since I don't drink coffee, maybe you give me a free pass here that I yep. didn't get this one right away. We got one more image to close with. Don't reveal just yet what it is because I, I feel like there's some kind of like glow lights involved in something like this, but perfect beads of water. Um, how far away is that subject from the, the plane uh, of glass the behind. essentially so so this is with the 105 macro and it's mm -hmm. it's the lens is probably this far from the from the surface of the glass that's holding the droplets of water underneath mm -hmm. that probably about that far i'm guessing maybe 15 16 inches what i did is i mm -hmm. went to my local uh home store and i got a lazy susan the kind that you put in the middle of the table so everybody can share food yeah, and, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So what I did is I took um, an LED light panel, the kind that have all the dots of light inside of them, and I laid it mm -hmm. flat on the Lazy Susan. And then I took little pieces of colored gels and I laid them out all across the the LED. So I have, as you can see, you know, there's green and yellow and magenta and blue yeah. and all kinds of different things. And I affixed them to the top of the LED. And then what I did is I just took my hand and I rotated the lazy Susan back and forth and I made like a five second exposure. And so what you're seeing is those streaks inside the water droplet. But if you look past the water droplets, you see it streaking in the background as well out of focus. Now the dot, the way you get the dot is a little bit of a hesitation at the end of each rotation. So when you get to the end of the rotation, if you just hesitate mm -hmm. a little bit, it'll right. burn in and create the dot. And the idea behind that is it, it creates movement. It makes it feel like it's like a comet. There's a dot and a tail behind it, but that's just mm -hmm. simply done by, you know, back and forth, back and forth. And there's some experimentation that goes on here. You gotta, mm -hmm. you know, what's the right rotation speed and you know, it's at five seconds or 10 seconds or what is it? But after some experimenting, you know, I was able to uh, make it work. I assume, you know, you just, you move along, it gets better, gets better. You see where you wanted to get better and you just keep going with it. And, uh, you know, since you're controlling the situation, let's go back to you being a control freak. Um, you know, you'll do this until you feel like you got exactly what you want. Yeah, but yes, absolutely. But the joy of it is right there. That's yeah. exactly, you asked me like why the macro, the macro, some people meditate, um, some people run, some people mountain bike, whatever, whatever you do. Some to people fall do. on mountain bikes like I do. Yeah. All those things. Um, yeah. I fall off the ladder. I'm up on a ladder a lot when I do this, that happens too. But fortunately, uh, you know, nothing too bad. But, but the point is, is, is it's the process, Mike. It's the process, yeah. the, the, the step by step by step as you feel yourself moving closer and closer and closer to what it is that you visualized in your head when you started. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's that process that the satisfaction comes from. A lot of people feel as though, oh, it's not working. Yes, it's working. The fact that it's not working is part of it working. It Every mistake you make moves you closer to the solution that works. And so mm -hmm. if, if you find, or at least I do, when I do macro work, that the hours just pass by because you're so focused on what you're doing, you find right. this flow state where all of a sudden four hours have passed, you've got what you wanted and you have no idea that it took you four hours because it was such a joy to do. Now on that note, that's, that's a great thing to, uh, to, to end on is, as we've, we've cut through this hour really quick. Uh, that's the best part of these hours fly by because there's so much great stories. There's so many great stories, so much great content. This is a little different for us. There's a lot more educating here about uh, process and lighting and, and in this case, macro. And it, it, listen, I have to tell you, we, we did an icon school online class with you on just this topic, uh, uh, close up in macro photography. So uh, those of you tuning in, check that out with Joey. And, um, you know, within this month of May, it's free online. So, Joey, I can't thank you enough for being with us. This was great. It went Pleasure by so fast. 
Uh, man, when these go, they go fast. I know we've talked a lot about yeah. really cool, cool stuff. And, um, but, uh, thank you for being, you know, uh, that technical professional photographer you are. I will tell you folks, look at Joey's website, check him out on Instagram, just Google Joey Terrell. And, um, that is your Instagram handle, right? Joey Terrell. Yep. Um, and, uh, and, and you're going to see some magnificent work, but, uh, follow his education because you will learn a lot and he offers it up to you uh, just from the goodness of his heart and, and soul. So thank you, Joey. Thank you, Mike. Uh, really appreciate all you stay do. Safe. Yeah. Thank you're you. welcome. And uh, listen, those of you tuning in for the creator's hour and this episode with Joey, uh, please take some of that passion he brings and, and use it. Um, learn some of these techniques, practice them, experiment and continue to stay safe during these rough times. Again, the creator's hour site has all kinds of things going on on social for Nikon USA. Um, we've got challenges. We've got two-minute videos of ambassadors and what they're doing during these times. Uh, we've got more great interviews with epic photographers, Joe McNally, Amy Vitale, Carol Guzzi, Lindsay Adario, you name it, uh, Lynn Goldsmith. Uh, we've got them all. So please stay tuned in. Everybody out there, be safe for Nikon. I am Mike Corrado, and we will see you soon. <laughs>